Good evening. Good evening. Welcome one and all to this gathering for worship, a service of hope and healing on behalf of the Newtown Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, and the Newtown United Methodist Church, as well as our many faith leaders and religious communities here in Newtown, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to this gathering. It's fitting and important for us to gather on this particular night, on this particular weekend. Not only do we inaugurate a president this weekend, but our nation also gathers to remember and honor the life and legacy of Martin Luther King, Jr. It has been a little more than five weeks since an event of unfathomable violence sent waves of shock and sorrow throughout this community and throughout the world itself. And though for many of us our grief is still very raw, as we step forward slowly down the path of healing and hope building, now more than ever the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. offers us a reminder of the kind of journey to which we are called. It is a journey that began long before those early moments of the events on December of 2012. It is a journey of peace and reconciliation. It is a journey which affirms the love, that love and not fear shall have the final say. It is a journey which understands that the means of our calling are just as important as the goal. Lest any think otherwise, such a journey does not end a month from now, or even a year or 10 years. It is a journey of a lifetime. For that journey is a way of life, a way that not only heals the wounds of individual souls, but heals the very soul of communities and nations as well. It knows that even though we may be tempted in the coming days to take shortcuts to achieve quick victories, even though we may find ourselves overwhelmed by unbearable sorrow or staggering gridlock or depressing apathy or mind-numbing complexity, ours is a calling too great and too holy to give in to the powers of death and destruction. It was King who reminded his congregation 55 years ago on Christmas Eve of this holy and sustained calling when he said, I've seen too much hate to want to hate. And every time I see it, I say to myself, hate is too great a burden to bear. Somehow we must be able to stand up against our most bitter opponents and say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will still love you. But be assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer, and one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win our freedom for ourselves, but we will appeal to your heart and your conscience that we will win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. We still seek the fulfillment, my friends, of that freedom, Freedom from bondage and isolation, from the threat of violence. Freedom that affirms the dignity and worth of every single human being. Freedom rooted in the promise and peace and fullness of life. Friends, there is bad news and there is good news for us this night. The bad news is that the journey ahead for many of us will be long and arduous. At times we may lose our way. But the good news is that we are not alone. There is one who is the great sustainer who will not let us go and who holds us up even when we grow weary. And there are others who travel the path with us. They are all around us this night. And one comes among us this night to offer us words of comfort and calling. And we welcome the Reverend Dr. James Forbes into our midst this night, and we're going to say a little bit more about you later. Some who might wonder, what does Martin Luther King Jr. have to do with us? 
we forget that King saw children in his own church taken from their beloved, from their loved ones by senseless violence when his church was bombed. And I do say senseless. How can it be that we somehow are able to think that violence can make any more sense when it is associated with tax against the color of one's skin or the faith of one's family? How is it that we can somehow think that violence makes sense under any circumstances? Indeed, we also forget the connection that this community has with Martin Luther King Jr. Ministers from this very community in Newtown traveled south long ago to march in the civil rights movement. When they returned here to Newtown, there were some in this very community who said to them and who wondered aloud, how is it that these clergy go off to a faraway place to get involved in other people's business? Shouldn't they be minding their own business here back at home? It was Martin Luther King who reminded those clergy and all of us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. My friends, this night, we come to remind ourselves that we forget at our peril the interconnectedness of our human family. When those clergy returned to Newtown after that time, there was a gathering in Edmund Town Hall where, because some had raised questions, the clergy there gathered and spoke about what their experience was. And at the end of that gathering, I'm told the folks in that room stood up and joined in a circle and grabbed hands and sung, We Shall Overcome. Because they knew on that night that we are all interconnected. We are part of one fabric. Our destiny, our destiny lies in our ability to be one as a community, as a nation, as a world. It's why we gather here tonight for healing and hope and to discern together what it is that God is calling us to do and be in this time and place. Even while we still grieve, even while we still wonder if we can take one more step down the path that is before us. Let us know. Let us trust that God is with us and that those here gathered are a reminder to us that we are not alone. And we will find our way. And now, let us gather for worship. Tonight we gather to connect, to grieve, to ask what's next. Tonight we gather to remember, to honor, to find our footing. Tonight we gather to listen, to pray, to contemplate hope. Tonight we gather to imagine, to heal, to speak truth with love. Tonight we gather to find strength and vision and the courage we need. To mend hearts. Restore lives, heal divisions, and, and transform, transform our, our world. Let us stand now and join in singing our opening song, 
When aimless violence takes those we love, it is number 512 in the red hymnal in the pew. Please be seated. Now we would like to invite our friends and neighbors the Newtown Islamic Society to come forward and offer prayer and words tonight. بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقاء الذي يصل النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا 
والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And all praise is due to Allah, to the Lord of all the worlds. The, world, the name Allah is used in the Arabic language. I just wanted to describe this to you so everybody has understanding. It is a word without a root. And the context that the scholars use it for is, that's used in the Quran, I should say, and the scholars explain it as that it embodies all the beautiful names of God. So it's not some other God, it's not a contrary, it's the same God. It just embodies all the beautiful names such as the merciful, the compassionate, the benevolent, the compeller of the hearts, and all these beautiful names that God is described with. In the Arabic language um, and the Islamic tradition, assalamu alaikum means peace be upon you. And it has a root word, which is a verb that is very descriptive. And I think this is the same thing that Martin Luther King was trying to have for all race, colors, creeds, and everybody on earth. And it is derived from a verb which is called salima, and it means to be safe, sound, unharmed, unimpaired, intact, safe, secure, to be unobjectably blameless, faultless, to be certain, established, clearly proven, and to escape, and to be free. If a person was to take a look at one's life and goals, it is to achieve this purpose of peace. No matter if it is trying to acquire material benefit, worldly benefit, or spiritual growth, a state of peace is involved. It is told in the Islamic tradition that once one enters paradise, that he or she will say an unnumbered amount of times, peace, 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 that this peace you have been looking for your whole life. The Quran states, your God is but one. There is no God other than him, compassionate and merciful. In the creation of the heavens and the earth, in the alteration of the night and the day, in the ships that plowed the seas to the benefit of man, in the water sent down from the heavens to revive the earth after it has been dead, in the different species of animals scattered across the earth, in the rotation of the winds, in the clouds that are subordinate to God's command between heaven and earth, and in all of this, there are signs for people who use their intellect. It also says, stated in the Quran, tell people to reflect with care and see what things the heaven and the earth contain. The Quran encourages people to study human history and the peoples of the past with all the changes that they have undergone as a special source of knowledge. One of the signs of God's existence is the human being in our history. So let us reflect on, uh, let us reflect tonight on one of the signs of our Lord, which is Dr. Martin Luther King, I mean Martin Luther King Jr. and some of the history he left behind. I think some of the most relevant uh, things that he left that can be implemented today are some of his actual statements. And I just want to read off a few of them and give some Islamic reflections. Dr. King said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. So after these tragic events, the first step that could be taken is having faith in God and implementing the principles and the morals that all the messengers have left us. And this statement makes me reflect upon the verse in the Quran that says, this is a book without any doubt it contains a guidance for the god fearing those who believe in the unseen and establish the prayer and spend from what we have provided for them. Those who believe in what has been sent down to you and what has been sent down before you and have certainty about the hereafter. These are the people that are guided. Another quote from Dr. King is, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. The Quran says, a messenger has been sent to you reciting clear signs to you to bring you those who believe and do right actions out of the darkness into light. Another quote, the ultimate measure, this is from Dr. King, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Another quote from Dr. King is, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. And this is definitely an all faith principle and moral that we shall all implement in our daily lives. And uh, it's actually an Islamic tradition that the Prophet Muhammad said that 
the Muslim is the one who is safe, meaning the, the, the mutual person is the one who is safe from, the Muslim is the one who is safe actually from his fellow Muslim, meaning that these two people are on the same terms, same type of standards. But the believer is the one who everybody is safe from. So irrespective of differences or whatever, the believer is the one who everybody is safe from. <clears throat> Dr. King said, nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who yields. It is a sword that heals it. And um, one more reflection on the Islamic tradition is that in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, so Islam, peace be upon him, that's the translation of that, is that there was a time in Taif, which is not too far from uh, Mecca, that he went to actually introduce and Islam just means submission to God, so that's another thing, just understand that, is that he went to introduce submission to God, to the people. And they actually stoned him, stoned him to death so bad that he was bleeding in pretty much all parts of his body. And it is told in the tradition that the angel from the mountains, because in Islamic belief, we believe that angels are the means in which God intervenes into the world. And it was actually told that the angel from the mountains came to the Prophet Muhammad so Islam, and said, do you want me to make the mountains come together on these people because they've done this tragedy to you? And he said, no. He said, verily, maybe one day they will become righteous believing people. Leave them alone. So this beautiful legacy that is in Islam, but also within Martin Luther King that he left, such as nonviolent approaches and determinations, patience, and obviously I don't, I think he probably very well knew that the fruit of his labor was not going to be seen obviously in his lifetime, but in today, such as a gathering today. So let us take out tonight and remember Dr. Martin Luther King and one more Quranic statement that I want to make is the Quran says, mankind recreated you from a male and a female and made you into peoples and tribes so that you might come to know each other. The noblest among you in God's sight is the one who is the most God conscious or aware. God is all knowing, all aware. And I thank God for uh, bringing Martin Luther King to my life because it's very relevant in my life because I'm, of, I'm half black, half white. And the time that my parents actually conceived me, that was pretty much a no-no at that time. And uh, it actually brung some dynamic things to my life. And it brung two Color, different people from different color spectrums, as you could say, together. And it bonded a whole different world for me. So I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and remembering Martin Luther King and remembering God, period, point blank, because when you have him in the forefront, that's when everything goes right. But when you put him in the back seat, that's when everything goes wrong. And thank you very much. Thank you. I believe it was just a few days after the events of December 14th that a gifted musician within our own community wrote a song, a song that uh, he wrote uh, and shared and has uh, gathered children to share with others. And so we're so blessed tonight that Jim Allen is here with this collection of singers uh, who are here to share this wonderful calling to us, a wonderful prayer about our beautiful, my beautiful town. And so we're going to invite all of those singers and Jim to come forward at this time and let us hear their rendition of my beautiful town.
It's my privilege to introduce the one who brings us a message this night. And after hearing that song, I have to tell you, Jim, I think you have a challenge before you to move this community in the way that that song does. Jim Forbes is pastor, 
senior, senior minister emeritus of the Riverside Church in New York City where he served for 18 years. He pastored and ministered in that church during the events of 9-11 as he ministered both to that community directly but also to a city. Since his leaving of Riverside Church into, I'm not sure if we can call it really retirement, uh, he seems as busy as ever, he is president and founder of the Healing of the Nations Foundation, which is a nonpartisan, interfaith, not-for-profit organization, which promotes holistic understanding of health and wellness. The foundation seeks to broaden the awareness of the interrelatedness of physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and community health. Through his work, Jim encourages individuals, families, and communities to be seriously committed to achieving and sustaining good health, not only for themselves, but also the health and wellness of others. As one might imagine for one like Dr. Forbes, who has been promoting this all his life, the foundation seeks to promote conversations and cooperative ventures across boundaries of faith traditions, professional disciplines, and cultural perspectives. Jim Forbes learned how to preach in a parish. He held pastorates in Richmond, Virginia, in Wilmington, North Carolina, Roxboro, North Carolina. He worked as a campus minister for Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. Jim holds three degrees and has been awarded 13 honorary degrees. Boy, people just want you to come visit, don't they? From 1992 to 2007, Dr. Forbes was co-chair of a partnership of faith and interfaith organization of clergy among New York's Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and Muslim communities. He has served on many boards and committees. He has preached to many different peoples throughout this country and the world. He has led workshops and retreats for the National Council of Churches, for campus ministries, for the American Baptist Churches, for the United Church of Christ, for the African Methodist Episcopal Church, for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, for the Episcopal Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church. The reason he's led all these is because this man knows how to preach. He knows how to speak the truth in love. He knows how to blend passion and compassion and to invite people to consider what it is that we are called to do and be in all seasons. There is no one more fit to come to us this evening and to invite us into a conversation to consider what we are called to do and be in this season of our town and of the world. It's my privilege to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. James Alexander Forbes, Jr. Thank you, Reverend Kreben. Brothers and sisters, I believe we are here tonight convened by the spirit of love, and truth, hope, and healing. And I'm glad to be in that kind of setting because I need healing, and I need hope, and I need love, and I want to live by the mandates of truth. Let me say before I begin to read the scripture that will inform my presentation that I should acknowledge that the person who sparked uh, this idea of my coming to be with you is Edie Bojan. She was a counselor 
at ground zero during the 9-11 series of uh, days of agony. And she came to be with us at Riverside Church and found some meaning in the ministry and began even way back then trying to make sure that I would not keep my ministry located in New York City at the Riverside Church, but she's been trying to get me out ever since. And this is the continuation of that effort. Edith Stan, so they'll know who sparked this. <clears throat> and accompanying Edie are three other people from Riverside family, my wife and uh, uh, Nancy Rhodes and Dr. Davis, Evelyn Davis. You two stand, because you're part of the team for tonight, please. And I guess, before reading the text, I want to express my gratitude for the singing that the young people offered us and reminding us of appreciation for our beautiful town. I am sure those words will be a source of encouragement in the days ahead, and how beautiful, how beautiful. So I want, to, I want to offer a song back to you, not to sing it so much as to just say, we know why we are here. Tragic circumstances visited our town, and we have been doing the best we could to hold things together. It's been over a month now, and we keep wondering, Lord, when will we begin to be able to return to normality. Will normality ever be possible? What shall we do? So here we are tonight. And my little song back to my partners who are the singers for the night came to me during a very happy time. I had been released from Riverside for a sabbatical, which I took at Harvard Divinity School to teach a course on urban ministry. In Cambridge, I enjoyed myself so much. Every day, everything was just wonderful. Until as I was walking back to my little place on Maple Street, the idea came to me, my goodness, God has blessed me so much. Until a little song came to mind, which I think may be appropriate for the spirit of this gathering here tonight. The song goes something like this. I looked around the other day and saw how truly blessed this life of mine has been. I have health, strength, and comfort, peace and joy within, special care in times of desperation, a helping hand when friends are few. So I asked, dear Lord, what can I do to turn some thanks to you? I expected mission impossible, call to service far away, but instead this gentle assignment God sends to us each day. Love my children, that's all I ask of you. Love my children, that's what we've got to do. If you love them as I love them, we shall see them safely through. Love yourself, love me too. And whatever else you do, love my children. I hear that tonight. In fact, all over the United States, because of the loss, because of the tragedy, people are renewing their sense of the importance of loving the children. Respect them and protect them. Uphold them and enfold them. Affirm the gifts inside of them until they learn to take pride in them. If they falter, if they stray, don't lose heart. Find another way. 
That's what love is all about. Love my children. Love yourself. Love me too. Love the ones who are close to you. Love the one who has brought you through. And whatsoever else you do, love my children. So that's the way I want to start with you. Now, now I want to read a passage of scripture tonight. And what I'm going to be speaking to you about will be words of hope and healing. And that's not so much what I'll be doing. I'm going to point you to some sources that are giving words of hope and healing. And your job is to listen for the word, the word that addresses inarticulate inquiries in your spirit, words that might acknowledge what you are asking, words that may give you confidence that it's going to be all right and we're going to make it through. In whatever I say tonight, beginning with the reading of the text and some words of explication, keep your ears open. What does God have to say to me that might help me Keep on keeping on, moving on, holding dear sentiments that do not rest well. That's it. So now, with that background, let me read a passage of scripture. Are you listening? Now, Reading from Genesis chapter 4. The man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. It's desires for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. 
a very difficult text for these times. But maybe we can hear something from God that actually becomes a word of hope and of healing. All right, now, with that kind of uh, heavy beginning, let me say that, yes, this is Dr. King's, King's birthday celebration weekend along with an inauguration. And yes, I did have the privilege of being a part of the struggle. I'm from the South, North Carolina. I actually participated in the marches. I was arrested at Sappho's Restaurant in Wilmington, North Carolina. Yes, I actually had the privilege of being arrested at the embassy when South Africa was engaged in the policy of apartheid. Uh, I've, I've gone through this period. And I want to tell you that we have made progress. One of the ways to get encouragement is to recognize that there was once a struggle but that we made progress in it, which then will give us confidence that the issue we are wrestling with here now, who knows, we may make progress there as well. Let me mention about this. You all remember that at first most of us tended to think about Dr. King in relationship to racial integration. Well, let me tell you a little story about racial integration. I was one of the first dudes after they had the integration of Woolworth Lunch Counter in Raleigh, North Carolina. After the marching with King and the regulations came around that black people who had been separated from white people, we we're all citizens together. Why don't we just live together without all this foolishness? So my brother David was the head of the student body at Shaw University. When they got through picketing, finally Woolworth opened up the counter. I remember the day when I went down, had my little money together, and I knew exactly what I was going to buy. I was going to get a hot dog with mustard, relish, and ketchup, and some chili, and a big orange. And I was going to be able to enjoy it. Except, when I went into the store, there was a white woman sitting at the counter. I sat down beside her. As soon as I sat down, because this was first for her, it was a troublesome moment to have a black boy who used to buy his sandwich at the window to come and sit down beside her. She immediately got up, left her food there, ran out of the store. That was a humiliating moment for me, a very painful moment after all of the struggle. And here, things had not changed that much. I do not know whether or not I ordered my meal or not. I can't remember. What I do remember is that I went home and I uh, sat down and I wrote these words. Why did she move when I sat down? Surely she could not tell so soon that my Saturday bath had worn away. Or that passion had pushed me for a rape. She could not risk a theft so early in the month. And who knows that on tomorrow twould fall her lot to drink her coffee from a cup my darkened hands had clutched. So horrible was that moment I too should have run away. For prejudice has the odor of a dying beast. Whether rapist or racist... Both fall in the savage class. And the greatest theft of all is to rob one's right to be. Now let me tell you something interesting. I wrote that poem January 11th, 1961. Had forgotten it until I went to Riverside Church. And now, see, things can change, folks. I'm telling you things can change. Now... I am the senior minister of the Riverside Church. And it's now 30 years since that time. I get a call for an opportunity for a member to visit me. She happens to be, as well, you know, Riverside's an integrated church. So she's a white woman. She wanted to talk to me. She came to me and she says, uh, uh, Reverend Forbes, 
I wanted to talk to you. I was going through some of my things, and I found a, um, I found a letter that I had gotten back in 1961, and in it, you had enclosed a poem. I had forgotten about the poem. And she said, I wanted to return it to you. Let me explain something to you. Why did I, a man who had experienced one white woman running away, why had I sent that letter to another white woman? Because she was working in our community at the United Church, bringing black kids together across town to participate in both recreational and educational opportunities, and she cared for us. So that when I was hurt so deeply, I thought I better send it to her because if I'm hurting, she's hurting too. So Dorothy Marcus gave me the poem, and it reminded me why it's hard for me to be a racist. I, I might look like one, but Lord knows it's hard. You know why? I learned a long time ago that you cannot put people into categories based on their external appearance. You got to know folks. See, see, some folks can choose that which is including and other folks due to something inside of them are not yet ready to venture into a more inclusive, beloved community. I learned that progress is made. But the fact is that here's a guy who used to live with discrimination all the time, and now after, the, after bloodshed, after the dogs, after the hoses, after Supreme Court decisions, after legislations of amendments to the Constitution, after all, things are not perfect. And I want to warn you, I do see some, type, some evidences of backsliding, but we do not live as a segregated society. We are not fully integrated, folks. Don't, don't let me make you think uh, uh, something that's not true. But, but we've made progress in race. But now here we are. We are not here to talk about race relations. We have seen that violence can strike anywhere, and it leaves our hearts naked, vulnerable, exposed. We know that. So Dr. King, who talked about race relations, yes, but he also talked about nonviolence. And here we are. And uh, I need not hold you in suspense. Basically, I'm wondering if, if sometime later in the future, like was 30 years from my January 11th to the 91 when 30 years later I saw Dorothy Marcus and we saw that we had made lots of progress. What if, oh, if it takes 30 years, what if? The activities that took place in Newtown actually, because of the way different folks on different sides work through it, what if 30 years from now, history? would record that something happened in Newtown that led to a new America. Then the tragedy, as I've said to others, when tragedy comes, don't just sit around and mope and cry. Incessantly, we must have cry. We must have grief. We, we must deal with the pain. But in addition, if tragedy comes, 
we should make it pay dearly as a tribute to those whose lives have been lost. We must extract from the tragedy that which really makes our town go down in history as the place where the most awful thing happened, but by the nature of God's action, things began to be dealt with, to be questioned, to be thought, and that out of it, America What's the phrase? New town leads to a new America. Well, let me let me back up and, and share with you some words of hope and healing. So during the 9-11 struggle, I learned that there are some realities that speak hope and healing. And I want to mention the first one now. The first one is the body. That's right. The body. The body. People want to know, how can we get through this awful time well, to tell the truth, I need your help on this one. For those of you who were closest to the tragedy, and, and yet you, you've made it through, why don't you agree with me if you think it's true that the, one of the ways you made it through was that your body led you through this early phase of that grief. And I just, I, 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 I just want to thank God, as the psalmist did, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And for all of the things that God did in making us who we are, God put inside of each and every one of us the capacity to deal with loss, the capacity to grieve, the body knows how to take each one of us through grief. It tells us when to cry without even consulting with us. <laughs> it allows us, even when we wonder if it's appropriate, to have a positive moment and even a chuckle. It tells us when we should rest. It tells us when we should get up and walk alone. It tells us when we should get with other people. And that body tells us the timetable. How soon for this? How soon for that? Uh, shall I make up the bed? Shall I clean the cloth? The, bo the body, the, the body, when we respect it, speaks. And for people who are sensitive and listen, the truth of the matter is, you've made it this far largely under the tutelage of your body. Thank God for the body. It's a smart thing, you know. It's a gift of God. The body, in fact, maybe one of the ways we make it through is be exceedingly sensitive and careful for the body. Make sure that it gets as much regularity, appropriate nutrition. Make sure that, that you listen to it. It will get us through. That's the first one. The second one is community. We are individuals. Each of us has our own individual body. But even if we have not always been aware of it, there is an infrastructure of relatedness, of interrelatedness, that we may most, most of the time take for granted. But God also has arranged that in times of trouble, something like a matrix underneath rises up to the awareness. And we understand that, well, the African proverb used to be, I am because we are. We would not have been able to make it through in New York City. You would not have been able to make it through even thus far. But community, sources of care, of concern, of support, of encouragement, 
something about community. You didn't even know you didn't even know you were that tight. But during tragic moments, you discover, my goodness, Dr. King was right. Caught up in an inescapable web of mutuality. We belong to each other. We have family names, but, but the community itself is even stronger than family, usually in times of trouble. Thank God for what the community says. The community says, listen, we're in this together. The community says, folks, Maya Angelou was right. We are more alike than we are unalike. The community says, listen, if we hang in here, we're coming through this. And in some ways, we're going to find some strength that comes even out of our loss. We will not ever forget, but we may remember with less and less pain, eventually, though not yet, the community has a way of saying, as a matter of fact, there are some things that we have needed to do that we have not done. But in the light of this, let's take time to put our heads together to really make our wonderful town more beautiful than it ever was before. But of course, as a preacher, you know I got a third point, and that would be, that would be, that, and I've talked about what the body does and what, and what the community does. But I want to I wanna, I wanna speak about what the Spirit does. What the Spirit does. The Spirit speaks to us. And uh, I think I'm coming to, to a point of saying, folks, listen to what the Spirit says. And I think... I think we're going to make it through. I think we, I, see, history was made on us. Did you hear that? History was made on us. But if we listen to what the Spirit says, we will make history. That we will not be victimized by or either scandalized by. Uh, no, we, if we listen to what the Spirit says, we as a town, we'll be able to say out of the depths of despair, there has emerged a glowing light that became a beacon to the entire nation. You heard me say earlier, new town, where we began to be a new America. Let me mention, maybe I'll discipline myself for time's sake, for just to maybe three things that the Spirit might be saying to us. First thing, I really need the reference to Romans 8, chapter 8. In there, the Spirit tells us this. It says somewhere that, that Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed. Isn't that an amazing statement? Does he know how much we are suffering? Does he know how much it hurts? Does he know how we will never be the same again? Yeah, he knows that. But he says there's something about folks that listen to the Spirit that the Spirit can take that which is worse than hell itself. And yet, that the sufferings of the present time may not even be compared. No, come on, Paul, don't you understand? The loss, the sadness, the nightmares, the dreams, the fears, the anxiety. Nevertheless, the Spirit takes us even beyond to say there is to be for those who put themselves in the hands of the Spirit a revelation of a glory about to be revealed. There are some good things waiting around the corner. Now, don't ask me. I'm no soothsayer about how soon it will come. Don't ask me, you know, what it's going to be. But the text forces us away from 
being held hostage to the horrors of the past by intimating that there is a glory about to be revealed this year, next year, in the 20s, 30 years from now. And you listen to the Spirit, and it will not allow you to remain fixated on the negation of the present moment. But it will be, that's the first thing the Spirit does. Second thing is the Spirit says, keep good contact. You must, you must remember to pray. Don't be ashamed to pray. If he, all of us were praying after 9-11, that's what we were doing when we sang God Bless America. As we lift our voices in a solemn prayer, God Bless America. We were praying. Don't be afraid to pray. And for those of you who are not regular prayers, don't you worry about it. The Spirit says, we know that you do not know how to pray, even as you ought. But it says, the Spirit with sighs and groanings too deep to be uttered will make intercession for you. So for those of you who don't know how to pray, just a quick primer on how to pray. I found out the other day, sometimes past, when I was in such an awful shape, I couldn't even get any words out to pray like a preacher ought to supposed to be praying. So I got down on my knees and I, and then after that I felt better. And then I said, oh, I feel better now, I'll pray. And the Spirit said, you don't have to pray, we've already heard your prayer. Because when you were doing like that, heaven is equipped to receive choreographed prayer. So listen, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to have any words to say, just choreograph. Everybody, let me, give, you, give me your fist. The stuff Come here, give me your fist. The stuff that's happened, let's just. <laughs> One third thing the Spirit does, and I, it's so stupendous that, that I just have to read it because otherwise you won't believe it. I'm, I'm, you think I'm making it up myself. So let, let me just find it right here. It says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. And you've got a right to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Show me how that's going to work for good. But first of all, please let me explain this. This does not mean that God wills things. Don't buy it when people tell you, this was just the will of the Lord. You just give in to the will of the Lord. Don't you buy that. In that kind of violence and loss, don't blame God for that. God doesn't will everything. But God wills something out of everything. That's what I'm talking about. That is to say, when it gets really bad, when the darkness seems to be the permanent condition of existence itself, don't you give up because... God has a way of reaching into nothingness and extracting something of great worth. This is why if you keep your eyes open to the Spirit and your ears, God will take that stuff that we cry about, that we lament, that we would wish we could not, that we could erase from our minds. God can take the awful, awful situation and, and work something so that out of it comes that which we can actually celebrate. That's why I mentioned what happened on race. If it could happen with respect to race... We had better watch out because I see some signs of backsliding with the black president in the White House. Some folks real nervous. They're in the middle of post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> but if God could work it out there, why is it not possible that what happened in Newtown 
leads to a new America that already you all have us discussing violence. Already we are discussing as a community gun violence, some kind of this way and some that way, but the discussion is going on. Already we are beginning to hear out of Washington executive orders and then Congress has got to do something with Joe Biden's report. Out of this, they did not die in vain. We, but I can't say it too triumphantly yet. But out of that bloodshed, I assure you, by the authority in the book, that God has a cosmic committee working on they are too precious to have died in vain. We're going to work something out of this and their legacy will be that, oh, we had founders of America, but they are new founders of a new America. Well, that's pretty much the sermon. How do I close it? Well, I want to close it by telling you what happened to me during that awful time of 9-11. Several things. One is the agony, the anguish, the funerals, the, the flowers, the flags, and here, the angels. I know, every time you pass, it's all fresh again. Until the only way I could make it was get up in the morning and pray. And I did. I said, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me as I move throughout this day. May your promptings deep inside me show me what to do and say. In the power of your presence, strength and courage will increase. In the wisdom of your guidance is the path that leads to peace. And then I try to read a little scripture like that, like that Cain and Abel story I read. In it, God tells Cain, Cain, the impulse inside of you is really mad now. And when that aggressiveness is there, you really have to decide to take it and do something with it. Otherwise, it will take you. And sin is lurking at the door. You may have angry feelings, and you may be aggressive, and you may have anxiety and fear, but you must master it. You must get in charge of it and make sure that whatever is pressing you that might turn destructive, that you take it and turn it towards the constructive, rehabilitative possibilities. Don't let it have possession of you. You take it and, and, and make something out of it that builds up community rather than tears down or destroys or kills. The spirit during that time was with me so until I had a strange experience. One Sunday morning, out of the rubble, a white pigeon flew up. And people thought, that's strange. They said no more life could be there anymore. What does this mean? I thought I knew what it meant. I thought it meant that God says, America, I've heard your prayer. You've been praying God bless America like we pray God bless Newtown. And I have heard your prayer. And I am answering your prayer in the form of this, this, this pigeon. Now, you know in the Bible, it is the dove that is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. But, of course, if you've got a crisis situation and you do not have a dove, a pigeon will have to do. So, so, so the, Lord, the Lord says, I, I'm gonna, I am going to bless you by letting the dove of my spirit come and speak to you. So... Finally, before I close with my song, following things. We have violence in the land. It needs to be dealt with. If we don't deal with it, Dr. King says we are going to annihilate ourselves. Our species will be talked about as the species that became such total predators that they began to turn on each other. And the anxiety that required them to arm themselves to the guild caused them to be always on edge. And at each provocation, they found themselves in problem-solving modes that were destructive. Somehow, the Spirit wants us, 
oh, I don't think the Spirit's going to grab up all the guns. I don't think so. But the Spirit is going to get us like making a decision. Do you want to be the world's greatest purveyor of violence, as Dr. King said? Or would we like to tilt, tilt ourselves towards an increasingly peaceful area and creating the conditions of justice and compassion and sensitivity so we can live in peace? That's what I think the Spirit wants us to do. And also, the Spirit wants us to know that God has a real enemy. You cannot serve God and mammon. And if you want to serve God, money as a driving force behind industries has to be checked. Not taken away. Don't take nobody's money away. I'll get killed even suggesting that. But, but, but somehow, if something is being driven by, by greed, right. we got to find a way. Tilt that back. Newtown, you might have to help us to do it. You got folks on both sides. Y'all got to wrestle that thing through. It's something that both sides are going to have to figure out. How do you short of taking folks' rights away? The Lord told me to tell you this too. Don't simply be worried about your Second Amendment rights. God says there's such a thing as a Second Commandment. Thou shalt not make an idol. And sometimes instruments of war can become idols. And you got to recognize there's a second, there's a second part to the great commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul, and all thy strength. But the second part, I know you worry about the Second Amendment, but what about the second part? And love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, that's enough for tonight. I'm going to close like I started the day off. When I was in that deep, deep anguish out of 9-11, that's when I also wrote another song. And this one I'm going to close with. And if you want to sing it, it doesn't have to have guitar, doesn't have to have piano, because I sang it in the shower. But this is... <laughs> and it goes something like this. I'm going to take heart and get moving. Though the clouds hang heavy and gray, if I wait for blue sky perfection, I'll be waiting till judgment day. Why let myself be held hostage, trapped and blocked by who knows what, will standing still in sinking sand reverse my fate? Certainly not. I'm going to break out and risk living, though the reasons to wait still abound. I will do what I can in the climate of now till better days roll around. So take heart, my sisters and brothers. Give your spirit a holiday. Away with the reasons, delaying the season. Celebration is the order of the day. I really mean it. Celebration is the order of the day. Dun, dun, dun. Words of hope and healing. Words like body and community and spirit. Reverend Forbes said to us, don't be afraid to pray. He even got us started. We're going to try that out now. A little praying. So I invite you to find the ground under your feet, and I invite you to make note of your bodies that breathe without you asking them to. Breathe even when you forget to take a breath. Remember now and take a breath, a deep breath. And exhale that breath and know that we are breathing common air here in this room. Sometimes in our Christian faith, we make a connection between breath and spirit. 
And so the next time you take a breath, you might note the way the spirit moves among us and also moves within us and through us. And find the ground beneath your feet and take another breath. And consider this. What if something that happened in Newtown led to a new America? Ask that question like a prayer. And take a breath. A spirit breath and let it out. As you came in this evening, I hope you were handed a card and a pencil. There are stacks of paper at the back of the room, and if someone needs paper and waves a hand, perhaps someone at the back would bring you a piece. You might also have picked up a pencil. I invite you to dwell in the silence together for a moment or two. To notice your own bodies, to notice your breath, our shared breath, that spirit breath, to let that invitation echo in your ear. What if something that happened in Newtown led to a new America? And then I invite you to write on your card a prayer, a word. Maybe it's an expression of commitment, a way that you can imagine taking a step toward that new America. Maybe even leading another few folks on that walk. You might write down a word of commitment or a prayer of hope. Or maybe it's just your version of fists pounding the air. If that's where you are, then write that down. We'll take a couple of moments. And then, as we are gifted by music, baskets will come through the room, and you're invited to lay those prayers into those baskets. They'll all be brought up to the front where they can be prayed over all together. Are you all ready to try out this praying thing? Then join me in a time of silence. And as you're ready, write those prayers.
us turn our thoughts today to Martin Luther King and recognize that there are ties between us, all men and women living on the earth, ties of hope and love, sister and brother. That we are bound together in our desire to see the world become a place in which our children can grow free and strong. We are bound together by the task that stands before us and the road that lies ahead. We are bound There is a feeling like the clenching of a fist. There is a hunger in the center of the chest. There is a passage through the darkness and the mist. And though the body sleeps, the heart will never rest. Shed a little light, oh Lord. Shed a little light, oh Lord. So that we can see. Oh, yeah. Just a little light, oh, Just a little light, oh Lord. Lord. Gonna stand it on up, stand it on up, stand it on up, oh Lord. Lord. Yeah, now. Gonna walk it on down, gonna shed a little, shed light. A little light, oh Lord. Can't get no light from a dollar bill. feeling like the clenching of a fist. There is a hunger in the center of the chest. There is a passage through the darkness and the mist. And though the body sleeps, the heart will never rest. Oh, let us turn our thoughts today to Martin Luther and recognize that there are ties between us, all men and women living on the earth. Ties of hope and love, sister and brotherhood. Now I'd like to invite our prayers to come forward in our baskets and Reverend Mel Kawakami, our senior minister from the Newtown United Methodist Church to come forward and offer us a prayer. Let us pray. 
Oh God, we come before you with broken hearts, with healing hearts. We come before you with angry hearts and reconciling hearts. We come before you with vengeful hearts and forgiving hearts. We come before you with yearning hearts and hopeful hearts. So God of us all, bless these prayers that tie us together in a journey of grief and of healing. Grant to us nonviolence amid the suffering. Grant us peace and a spirit of compassion. Grant us reconciliation and a commitment to being a community where we choose love. Grant, O oh God, that we have not only a new town, but a new America. We pray all of this in the name of the God of love, as we all say, Amen. As we prepare to close our service, let us hear these words from the Broadway show Godspell, the song Beautiful City, words of promise in the midst of despair, words about building a new community, a beautiful new town, a new city. Oh, <laughs> 
One last ritual of hope and healing. So, whatever is heavy in your heart, take it into one hand. And whatever is heavy in this city, take it in the other hand and lift it into the hands of God to see what God might do. You'd be surprised. It will not bring you immediately the joy you know, but it will lighten the burden so that you may go forth into the light of God's healing grace. So I'm going to give the benediction and I'm asking you in your heart and this whole situation, Lord, we're putting it in your hands to see what you will do with it. Will you do that? Now, go forth in the name of the Lord to spread glad tidings abroad. The love that you share and the witness you bear will bring honor and glory to God. Go forth with a joyful amen until we gather again. Remember the word your spirit has heard. God's love is the hope of the world. Amen. amen. And we'd like to invite you now to stand and as we close and prepare to leave, Sing together, hymn number 630, We Shall Overcome. hands I'll give you the lines we the Lord shall see us through the Lord will 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 see us through
We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. afraid today. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid today. The truth shall make us free. 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 shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. Someday. Peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.